still get a lot out of this, this session, but they do build off one another. Um, and I, I, I briefly went through why I think there's confusion regarding the Lord's table. Uh, anytime you have an issue, the adversary, a highly significant issue that makes an impact to God's honor and glory, um, that's something that the adversary wants to confuse. And uh, there's a lot of confusion regarding this issue, um, whether how you do it, the doctrine behind it, uh, just a whole host of things. Uh, is it a supper? Is it bread and wine? All, all, all these things are involved in that. And I shared the reason why I think there's so much confusion is a, a failure to understand that we are able ministers of the New Testament, meaning we are also beneficiaries of the, the spiritual things of the New Testament. And that's kind of where we're starting right now. Uh, and what we started to look at last lesson is the difference between the Old and New Testaments and, and seeing, therefore, that we can be able ministers of the New Testament. And we are beneficiaries of the New Testament. And the reason why I'm going into that because the Lord's table was instituted uh, the night uh, the Lord was betrayed, as we'll read in the passage. Uh, they had it with the Feast of Passover. That's where we need to rightly divide. We're not partaking in the, the Feast of Passover. But it also was a separated issue that night. Uh, when, he, when he instituted the, the, the Lord's table. Uh, and, and therefore, it's a part of the, that New Testament, the spiritual things of the New Testament. And so, again, uh, I ask you to bear with me as we go through these next few weeks. Uh, there's probably questions regarding all of this. I get, again, I said in the beginning, uh, as far as what we're doing, we are not doing anything wrong um, with, with having a, you know, a meal. Uh, there's, we're not in a, doing it ungodly fashion like the Corinthians were doing. Uh, however, at the same time, I don't think it's the Lord's table. Um, and as we go through, I'll, I'll show you that. And, so, and, and, I'll, and I'll explain after we're done with all this what you know, the elders and I and, and the men who attend the men mean, what we uh, saw and what we got into and the decisions, uh, decision that we made. And we'll explain all that and you'll have plenty of time for questions and things like that. Uh, I'll give you time both in a, in a session as well as at the annual congregational meeting. So um, while we get into it, we'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll read verse 17 through the end of the chapter. We'll pray, and then we'll get back into our study this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which, I also, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. For when we are judged, we are cha uh, chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look at this issue. And I do pray as we go forth that we would set aside the cares and concerns that we might have uh, as, as we live in this, this present evil world. And we would be attentive to hear uh, uh, regarding this matter of the Lord's table. And, and, and see the, the grandeur of it all, to see the seriousness of it all, and to see the, the, and get some understanding. So we do pray that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened according as, as a study in, our wor in the word here regarding this issue. And that the this issue would become effectually working in our inner man. And so we thank you for this time. Look at all these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, uh, 
I went through more when we started um, last lesson talking about all the things concerning this issue. Uh, and a lot of them will be answered. Again, you know, the, the bad connotations that come with it, the, the funeral type service uh, issue that, that comes along with communion and Lord's table, all the corrupt doctrine that comes from denominationalism, all those things. And when you come to learn right division, and you come to learn uh, the, the matters of right division, there's a tendency to come along and, and you separate yourself so far from those things, and rightly so. But at the same time, there's a tendency to say, well, they're doing, they're doing bread and wine. Well, we're going to do a supper. And there's a tendency to just come along and make a distinction based upon our own thinking instead of uh, what the scriptures teach. And so these are all things that we need to come to understand. And, and a lot of those things will be uh, answered as we go through. And again, one of the, the main reasons, not the only one, but one of the main reasons why there is so much confusion in this, uh, and even in what we call the grace message, is because of a, a lack of understanding of the New Testament and us being able ministers of that. We didn't, we're not going to go there right now, but Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 that he's an able minister. We are able ministers of the New Testament, meaning the very thing that he was ministering was New Testament, New Testament things. And we're going to take a look at all this, and, and, we, and we have been. And um, what we did before in the last lesson is we took a look at what uh, in that passage, 2 Corinthians 3, he distinguishes that he's an able minister of the New Testament, not of the letter, because the New Testament is not, not the letter. The letter is the, the Old Testament, but of the Spirit. And then he comes along and describes more of that letter, what that is, because he says the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life, smear, uh, lowercase s. And he calls this, this letter, the law, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, whatever you want to uh, call it, um, he says it's the ministration of death. And later on in the passage, he calls it the ministration of condemnation. And he compares that with the, the spirit, which giveth life, as the, the, the ministration of righteousness and the ministration of, I think it was the spirit, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and, and they're opposed. But what he says, he doesn't come along and say, and, and we looked at what this is. This was an issue of self-justification and self-sanctification. That at Israel, when they came to Mount Sinai, in, in Exodus 19... Uh, instead of learning their lessons from the education that God gave them regarding his, who he was and his grace that he would do everything for them as he provided them food out in the wilderness, he provided them water out in the wilderness, when everything looked like it was tough, he did it all. And he says, I bear you on eagle, eagle's wings. I brought you out of Egypt. I did this. I did this. And then he says, if you therefore keep my commandments, then, you'll become, then you will be a peculiar people, uh, a, a peculiar treasure, a holy nation, uh, and, and, all the, and a kingdom of priests unto me. And he, and he brings a, a, a if-then principle. And if-thens aren't bad, but if if-then gets attached to it, blessings and curses, that's, that's a, a childish way to deal with things. As I, when I, as I deal with Abigail, if you do this, then you're going to get this. If you don't, then you're going to get this. That's how you deal with a child. That's, what they, that's the education you need to bring them up. But eventually, that's not going to be good enough. Anyways, it provided for them to justify themselves and sanctify themselves. And then we looked at Jeremiah 31 in Israel's program. And it talked about that he's going to make a covenant after those days with Israel, not according to the covenant he made with their fathers when he brought them out of Egypt, Exodus 19. Therefore, these covenants, these testaments, as we know them now, they're different from one another. If this one demanded you to do it, this one, God's going to do it. And that's why he says, I will, uh, 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 well, let's go back there and look at that. Look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, it's better if I quote it, Jeremiah 31, and look at verse 33, Jeremiah 31, verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. And we, in connection with that, we took a look at that. If In verse 32, he says, this covenant's not going to be according to this, this, this covenant. Then the law that he's going to put in their hearts isn't going to be this law. It's going to be a different law. And so that's what, we, that's what we took a look at in connection with that. But notice again, in verse 33, he says, 
After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law on their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. It's all God doing it for them. And that's different from them, them doing it themselves. And you need to see that fundamental issue that there's a difference between the letter, the Old Testament, and the Spirit in the New Testament. Because when Paul says he's an able minister of it in 2 Corinthians 3, he doesn't bring up a third option. He doesn't bring up a third option to, and, and what, what the New Testament provides for is perfect justification, perfect sanctification. And he doesn't bring up a third option in this dispensation of grace and how you're justified and sanctified. But rather, we benefit from the New Testament spiritual things. Again, this provided for them to do it. And there was physical things involved in that. Their, their work. This, is, this provides for spiritual things and for God to do it for them. And this is how we, by, by the Lord's death on that cross, His blood. And it's the blood of the New Testament. He doesn't have to come along and make a new way to make you spiritually fit to be utilized in, in his plan and purpose. This New Testament provides for you to be made spiritually fit, justification and sanctification. The plan and purpose he has for us, though, that's different. And that's why I built this. You can't. <laughs> Let me draw it over here because you can't see that at all. I can't see that. At all. That's why I drew this house down here. You have the issue of the foundation. And that foundation is Christ. And all throughout the scripture, you've been seeing one side of, the, of, of God's habitation of what he's doing. That's through, that was through prophecy. And you saw Christ in connection with prophecy. That's why Revelation comes along and says, the spirit of prophecy is Christ, or something to that extent. And, and this was Israel's program. Prophecy in Israel's program, and what you had involved there was God's recon reconciling the earth. And, 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 you had, and you had Christ in connection with that, but you only seen one part of the house. But he, but he from the found, before the foundation of the world, he had a mystery. He wasn't making it known, but he, but he, but he had it. He kept it hid within himself. But how he's going to get that mystery of Christ going is first you have the issue of of Christ and, and, the, and the, the New Testament spiritual provisions of Christ and what he's gonna build on that is not the prophecy of Christ he's gonna build on top of that the mystery of Christ but this foundation is similar that that New Testament the, the spiritual things in the New Testament and you have the dispensation of grace and in order to give the spiritual things that were given to Israel and, and give them to us apart from Israel, he, need, he needed to formulate a dispensation of grace, a, a unique time that he did not make known in time past. And that dispensation of grace that was going to take the foundation of Christ, the New Testament, the, those spiritual things, of that, that New Testament, and add to it that mystery of Christ, that's why when you get to Romans, well, chapter 1, we'll see in Romans 16, he says, Now, uh, now to him that uh, is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And you learn Paul's gospel, the time period in which he gives it is a mystery, but the content of his gospel, you can, he, sa he starts out Romans 1, is in the scriptures of the prophets. And, and we'll take a look at all that. And so you have, you have the Paul's gospel, unique because of the unique time period. It's not the gospel of the kingdom or any of those things, but it's unique. And on top of it, you have that mystery of Christ, the dispensation of grace he, he created, which was a, a, a mystery, and that's for the heavenly places. And this is God's universe. And that's why, again, when you get to, this is where I left off, when you get to Ephesians 1, when he says in the dispensation, the fullness of times, he'll gather together in one, in Christ, both that which is in heaven and that which is on earth, in him, even in him. And when you get to Ephesians 3, when he prays, 
to, to God the Father and His Son, in whom the whole family, both in heaven and earth, is named. Because that's the goal right there. And in order to get this functioning, to reconcile his universe back from the usurpation of the adversary, he needs this. That's why Paul can say, I'm an able minister of the New Testament. Now what I build on top of it isn't Hebrews Revelation, isn't the Gospel accounts, isn't Israel's program. What I build on top of it is my epistles. You're, 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 as, he, as he says there, he says, you're our epistle written in, in, in our hearts. And so you need to understand, because that New Testament, the, the, the Lord's table, communion, and partaking of it is not, because it's not part of that law, part of the Old Testament, is not a, a, a work of the law. It's not a rudiment, elementary type thing of the world. It's, it's not a feast day. It's something, a part of this New Testament. And if you think about it, if you think about it as a religious rite, and, and, and you think about it as a, a work of the law, then of course you're not going to do it because we're not under law, we're under grace. But this New Testament spirit, that's the issue of God's grace. God doing for them. That's why when you get to Jeremiah, it's God, I will, I will, I will, I will. It's the issue of his grace. That's why when you get over to uh, uh, James, and he talks about the royal law of liberty, and Hebrews talks about the spirit of grace. All those things. There's a transition. We were just talking about this at the break. There's a transition in Israel's program. At John the Baptist, he's he, with, with his baptism, he's dividing the apostate element of Israel from the, from the believing remnant of Israel. And they're starting to, to break off. And this provision, that blood of the New Testament, gets, they get benefit from it there in Acts 2. They start benefiting of those spiritual things, and they start benefiting from the New Testament. New Testament provisions. But yet, at the same time, they're under that Old Testament in the sense that that's the fifth course of punishment. That's, that was contracted for in the law contract, Leviticus 26. So they can't get out of that, but God gives them the capacity to get through it. Interesting. Paul talks about how, although we don't go through this time, the sufferings of this present time, he gives us the capacity to get through them, to endure through them, be patient in them, and have them work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. All that I'm trying to show you is that God doesn't need to create another way to make you and I spiritually fit in this dispensation of grace, but rather use what he covenanted with Israel and, and give it to us. And that's that foundation. And what he's going to build on top of that then is the mystery of Christ. And therefore, the Lord's table is something that we ought to partake in. And there's an added issue of the Lord's table that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11 that he didn't reveal with Israel during the Gospel accounts. It's a mystery aspect of the Lord's table that only you and I get the privilege to partake in. Come with me... Um, Let's, let's read through this, this, new, the, the, this passage again. Jeremiah 31, start in verse 31. And uh, notice that there's, there's five things in here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show them to you. Uh, verse 31, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's, that's all that's known right now. Prophecy, that new covenant, those things are going to be given to Israel. But he says, verse 32, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. There's, there's, you have an issue there. I will put my law in their inward parts. And write it in their hearts. There's, there's the first one. The second one, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's the second one. Third one, verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. So that was the third one. That's all going to be built on top of this. The fourth one. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. 
let me erase all this. We've gone through this before, but you need to bring all this with you as we deal with the Lord's table. Because if not, then uh, confusion will result. I always bring it over here and then I forget my chalk. So he says there, in verse 33, I will put my law in their inward parts. My law, I'll just put, I'll say in them, just to abbreviate. Oh, and, and, and write it on their hearts. And write. Okay? Second thing, and, and, and will be their God and they shall be my people. Be their God and be his people. The third one, I'm just going to summarize it in verse 34. He says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. There's a fundamental knowledge that everyone that benefits from that New Testament that's going to have. They're all going to know him. Now, knowing the Lord, it, it, it either can be just, uh, you know, when you know someone, it can just, it, there's all different levels of knowing someone. And so this is a fundamental level of, that they're going to have. They're going to know the Lord. They're not going to have to teach one another in this, in this capacity. But notice he says, the, the, their neighbor, they're not going to be teaching each other. There's going to be an education from the Lord. And so there's a, we'll just say a fellowship. When you start to know someone and, and, so, and, and someone's teaching you something, there's a, there's a fellowship there and, and a relationship. Uh, a fellowship with, and really it's an intimate fellowship, with God. Okay? These three are based upon, how, why can these three take place? For I will forgive their iniquity. Forgive iniquity. And what? Remember sin no more. Now what you have here is you have perfect justification. Sorry if you can't see that in the back. The bottom two, the last two, is perfect justification. He'll forgive your iniquity and he'll bring them up no more. And these three over here, I'll put it, I'll put it over here. I should have put it over here. It's perfect sanctification. Now, I know we've gone over this before, but we're going to go over it again, and we'll eventually go over it more because, oops, because you need to bring this with you. When he says in Romans 1, according to the spirit of holiness, this is what he's talking about. And this, again, this outlines the book of Romans. Where we are in Romans chapters 1 through 5 is the issue of the forgiveness of sins and remembering sin no more. And what we're going to eventually get into is his law in us. And then he's going to write some things on our heart. There's going to be a, a he's going to be our God and, and we'll be his people. And then there's an intimacy of fellowship with God. And, and, and that's how we, we, we can know what's ahead in the book of Romans. But again, that provides for a perfect justification and perfect sanctification. The reason why sanctification is first is because that's the goal. You need to have this before you can get this. Even though they take place right away, you're justified, and, then, and this is how you learn it this way. But this is the whole goal. This is what God has on his mind. Justification is a means to sanctify you, to do something within you, to have a relationship and have an intimate relationship with him. What I want you to see we shall already have an understanding of the forgive iniquity and remember sin no more. We've gone over that now in Romans chapters 1 through 5. 
what I want you to see is that Paul brings these three things up in his epistles as an able minister of the New Testament. I want to begin to see those things. Uh, come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, understanding that we're an able minister of the New Testament and, and, and therefore beneficiaries of it doesn't solve all the problems, but if you get this issue down, it's a little bit easier to grasp and, and swallow that we, are, we ought to be partaking in the Lord's table. Now, there's questions regarding what that Lord's table looks like, what it is, how you do it, all those things. But it's a little bit easier to grasp that this Lord's table, being a part of the New Testament, and if we're able ministers of the New Testament that we partake in it. Um, and so, again, what I want you to see, and, and we'll see it, we'll start back way in Romans, we'll, 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 we'll go see it through, that he, Paul brings up all these things in his epistles. Especially, get this, remember how I built that house and Christ is the foundation? Especially in the foundational epistles, Romans through Galatians. What, what, what he would add, add on top of that is the details of this fellowship with God and the intimacy of that. That's where the mystery of Christ gets brought up. And the deep things of God. And the inner counsel of his will in Ephesians chapter 1. That's going to take this issue that starts in Romans and just build it up. Build it up. Again, not Israel's program, but our program. But these, it's like a skeleton. The skeleton's there. And, and it's like you have two bodies... The, the skeleton is that structure that holds each, in, each, in, uh, each one of us up. But then you have, it's like you have, only, you have like two skeletons there. The skeleton's the same, but the, the body on top of it's different. The body on top of the skeleton, of this skeleton, Israel's program. And then you have the skeleton, the, the same skeleton, but on top of it is our program, the Church of the Body of Christ, and, and that information. Um, look at 2 Corinthians 3. Again, now the first one was, I'm going to, uh, my law in them and write it on their hearts. And so we're going to take a look at the writing on the hearts right now. Eventually we'll deal with that law, and I'll show you what that law is. But look at 2 Corinthians 3, and we, we dealt with this before but in last lesson. But verse 1, do we begin to commend ourselves, or need we as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you, now notice verse 2, ye are, you are, ye are our epistle, where? Written in our hearts, Written in our hearts known in, and read of all men. Not Israel's epistles, not Hebrews Revelation, not the gospel accounts, but ye are our epistle written in our hearts. And that's, that's the Corinthians. Now there's a lot more into that, but I want you to see what's being involved is that the writing on the heart's issue is the same. The issue is what is being written on your heart. And the only thing God's going to write on your heart in this dispensation of grace is Paul's epistles. But again, same issue, but what's being written on their hearts is what is, is, is them. <laughs> Look at verse 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, I don't have it up here anymore, but if you remember that last thing, I should have put these on slides, not that, not that ink, that old that letter, not the Old Testament, not written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. He's going to write them uh, in their inward parts, uh, his law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts. The reason why Paul can do that is because of the provisions of the New Testament. The reason why the Spirit can do that is because of the provisions of the New Testament. And Paul, he's going to go along and say, verse 4, And such trust have we through Christ to God word. Notice, he, this isn't something that Paul's wavering on. He's not coming along and saying, oh, maybe this is it, maybe it's not. He says, and such trust have we through Christ the God word. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also, and that's why he, he has to bring up also, because it was originally instituted and given to the twelve, and that remnant. 
But he says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. It's interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll eventually see it, but in Romans 8, when you start walking after the Spirit, and the Spirit starts doing some things within you, and He has done some things in you, He's baptized you in the Christ, in Romans chapter 6, and He's going to sum that all up in Romans chapter 8. And he talks about the spirit, the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Life, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And law, that law. A law different from the law of Moses. And if you understand Moses being the mediator of that first covenant, Christ being the mediator of the, 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 the new covenant, then it's, it's the, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Life and in, in, in Christ, but we'll eventually see it. So what I'm saying by that law, that law can't be that old law because it's not according to that old covenant. That law is something else. And that law is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And, and my understanding, Israel doesn't use that terminology, but that's the spirit writing on their hearts uh, and what is written on their hearts is developed in, in Hebrews through Revelation. Um... So that right in the hearts, Paul brings that up right here in this passage as he compares the Old Testament and the New Testament. Come over to chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This issue here, I will be their God and they shall be my people. If you know Israel's problem was right when they came out of Egypt, out of idolatry, they wanted to what? Go back into it. And this is the issue of that he's going to separate them unto, un, unto himself. I'll be their God and they shall be his people. Well, Corinthians, they came out of their idolatry worship, Gentile idolatry worship. They were saved by the gospel of Christ. How they died for their sins was buried and rose again. But guess what? They wanted to go back to the world. And how much fitting is it to bring this issue up? As they're able ministers of the New Testament, he'll, he'll bring this up. Look at, look at what they're doing. Uh, chapter 6, verse 11. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath, and it, it is an unequal yoke, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my what? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my son and daughter, saith the Lord. He goes from this one, he brings up both of them, actually, it's actually a passage where all three is included, but he, he brings up this one, I will walk in, that, this is how he's going to walk in you. By you following this law that's written in your heart, he's walking in you, he's dwelling in you. Then he brings up this one, that leads into the whole issue there. I will be a father unto you. Not just God Almighty, omniscient, omnipotent, but I will be a father unto you. Fellowship with God, an intimate fellowship with God. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So there's the first two. One passage showed all three. Look at 1 Corinthians 2. This can be taught in a lot of different passages. We'll eventually see one in Romans, but 1 Corinthians 2. Um, remember, well, we'll start here in verse 1. Remember when I told you when you get in our dispensation, this intimacy of fellowship with God goes into the deep things of God? That this starts to 
this starts to go in, and, 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 and through this, he starts teaching the mystery of Christ. What's interesting, well, I'll hold off. I've got to bite my tongue. I'm sorry. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse 1, because I want to... I want to, I want to build, build this up the way it's supposed to be built. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and, and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, not yet the wisdom of, the wor of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they, uh, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Well, he's revealed them to us. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his what? Spirit. Spirit, spirit of the living God. The, the spirit that, that, that we partake of because of the spiritual things of the New Testament. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the what? Deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Remember, see in your Bible, that should be a lowercase s there in verse 12. Lowercase s, in 2 Corinthians 3 it was a lowercase s. That, that spirit. The spirit which is of God, that ye might know the things that are freely given to who? Us. Of God. The things he's given to us. So again, you have that same issue. We have the spirit of God so that we can know the, the deep things of God that are given to us. There's that similarity issue, but difference. There's that foundational issue, but what's being built on top of it is different than Israel's program. In fact, this is what he's going to go over and deal with in chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Jump over there to chapter 3. Look at what he says. Verse 8. It says, Now he... I'm going to take this down. Just a little bit. If you remember my uh, really bad drawing house here, you have Christ... did that way. Tell I don't deal with the chalkboard very frequently. You have that route house, right? And um, he's going to talk about look at, look at how he's going to talk to these Corinthians here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He just got done dealing with what? The hidden wisdom of God. Which is the mystery of Christ. Now look at how he's going to talk to him about this. He says, look back there in chapter 2, verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are what? Perfect. That's a, that's a level of maturity. That's those that have this foundation. It's secure. And now you can go along and give them, give them the, the, the hidden wisdom. Unto those that are perfect, they have the maturity of level 1. They have that foundation. Which is Romans. But look at chapter 3, look at verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Well, a babe would be equivalent to what? A foundation of a building, right? That's when you did, everything just starts going. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. The meat being what he's going to add on top of this. Here's the milk, that foundation. Although a great foundation it is, justification is not just uh, the end all, it's the means to the end. And here's the meat here. And he can't give them that, he can't give them that meat. He can't give them the sanctifying issues, the further sanctifying issues of the, 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 that, the spiritual things in the New Testament. 
He says in verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, but for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? The reason why that envying and strife and divisions come about is because people don't got the milk down. And you got to get that milk. What I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that this, this line right here is the foundation. And, and the, uh, these two things are in that foundation. You get taught that in Romans. He's coming along now, and these Corinthians don't have Romans doctrine operating properly. Therefore, he can't give them additional issues of, of sanctification. But that's the, that's the order of things as we are beneficiaries of that New Testament. Let's take a look at this in Romans. Come back to Romans chapter 1. Not everything Paul said, and, and, and hear me on this, because it's, 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 it's it is a hair splitter, but, but you need to understand the hair split. Not everything Paul says is a mystery, but the time frame in which he says it is. Not everything Paul says is a mystery, but the time frame in which he says it is. You have the dispensation of grace. But again, that foundation there is dealt with in the New Test that New Testament. And Romans 1, verses 1 through 5, don't come along and let you say everything Paul says is a mystery. Look at Romans 1, verse 1. And we started this, we, we went back into it when we were in Romans 3. Look at Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. Now look, he's going to give some details regarding the gospel of God. He's, he's separated unto the gospel of God. Verse 2, which he, that's God, had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That's not a mystery. The content of his gospel is not a mystery. The time frame in which he's saying it, and he's saying it apart from Israel, that's a mystery. But these things that he's going to come along in Romans and give these saints in Rome, this, that's not a mystery. It's, it's in the scriptures of his prophets. Look what he goes on, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a lot of issues dealt with regarding God's son, Jesus Christ, who is now our Lord. But look, what he, look how he narrows this down for you. Instead of going back to the scriptures of the prophets and trying to figure out well, what, what, what was this gospel of God, what's the content of it all, he narrows it down for you. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The Davidic covenant, again we dealt with this, is, is God's mechanical means by which he will do for them that which they can't do for themselves. And there's five major issues that God has to do for them that which they can't do for themselves. Be their redeemer, their deliverer, their avenger, their king, and their blesser. We'll eventually go through that on Thursdays in our Bible survey. Those five issues. And instead of looking at all five of those issues, because he's not all five of those issues for us, this dispensation of grace, but he is our redeemer. And that's the issue that he's going to single out as he goes down to verse 2. He doesn't bring up the term, but he, he'll, he'll say it here. Verse 5, And declared to be the Son of God with power, now, there's a lot of power in the Bible. And those five issues, you have, his, you have his redeeming power, you have his delivering power, you have his avenging power, you have his king power, and his blessing power. All different kinds of power in connection with what he'll be for Israel, that which they can't be for themselves. They can't deliver themselves from their enemies. They can't avenge God's cause for themselves. They can't... You saw what they tried to do with King Saul. It was, a, it, was a, it was a mess. God had to put a king in there. David, type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. 
And they can't bless themselves, especially under that old, that old covenant because it's a performance-based contract. God needs to do it all for them. But that, Paul's not bringing up all those issues, though, all those different kinds of power. And he does that by the, the, the words he's saying here. Look at verse 4 again. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. See that spirit there again? Small s? Here's your spirit of holiness. He is going to come and be their redeemer, die on that cross to provide holiness for them. And if you want to be holy in God's sight, you need to be perfectly justified and you need to be perfectly sanctified. And that's the content of Paul's gospel. It was in the prophets. The only thing that wasn't in the prophets is the time frame in which... The, the, the time frame that Paul's given it and, and, and it being given to Gentiles apart from Israel. That's the mystery of it all. That's where he's going to, when you, when you start building this foundation, when you start getting the Romans 9, 10, 11, and he starts telling you you're not part of Israel's program, which instead of seeing this foundation and building on it wood, hand, stubble in Israel's program and all those things, you go, whoop, no, go this way. He's got a whole other program for us. And he's going to teach it to me as a father. And he's my God, and I'm going to be his people. So therefore, we should be able to find these five issues in Paul's gospel here in the book of Romans. Come over with me to Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 21. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God, what? Without, Without the law. Remember that Old Testament, New Testament? New Testament's not according to the Old Testament. You had a righteousness of God, a self, to, to justify yourself, a self-righteousness. Now you have the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And that's what, that's what it provides for. Righteousness of God without the law is manifested, but again, this was all... Made known, right? We, we just saw that in Romans chapter 1. Look what he says. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law itself actually witnessed to a law without itself. The law witnessed to a righteousness of God without that law. Because when someone would be under that law, and they would try to obtain to that righteousness, it would school them. That I can't justify myself. I can't sanctify myself. God, you need to do it for me. God, you're my righteousness. There's the righteousness of God without the law. Which really is who we're going to later find out is Christ. And we're getting that now. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his great... Uh, his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's that redeeming power in the gospel that he's going to preach. There, when he, when he uh, noted it there in verse 1. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. There it is. Dealing with the issue of sin. The forgiveness of sins. And remembering their sin no more. There you have justification. He'll cap that all off. That whole issue of remembering sin no more caps it off. You learn that in Romans 5. Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have peace with God, an eternal God. There's no more hostility. Sin's not going to be brought in the picture anymore. He'll remember your sin no more. That's what you receive when you're justified. You get done with chapter 5, he comes into chapter 6. Romans chapter uh, 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall someone say, God forbid? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, the Spirit doesn't get brought out here, but the Spirit is the member of the Godhead who baptized you into Christ. There's a lot of other baptisms. Romans 3, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 3, verse 11. 
There was the, the baptism with water. John the, bapti the Baptist would baptize him in water. And then after him, the disciples would baptize in water. You had the bapt baptism with the Holy Ghost. Christ was the one administering that baptism. Christ was up here. He administers the Spirit. And then you had the baptism of fire, the day of his wrath. Christ is the one administering that one as well. This one, you're baptized into Christ. So the minister isn't Christ. You're being baptized into him. You're not being baptized into water. The Spirit is the one baptizing you into Christ. And that's our one baptism. But the one, again, the one who's doing that is the Spirit. The Spirit of the living God. He's doing something where? In you. And he starts to bring out this issue. And the whole issue of the Spirit baptizing you into Christ becomes, by the time we get through it, I know I'm jumping ahead in our own edification, but it starts to become a law. A law that every time you operate upon it will work. And it's not that law, the law of Moses, it's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You have life because you've been baptized by the Spirit into Christ's death, burial, and, and resurrection. You can't taste it, touch it, or feel it, but that's what it is. That's what you have. In order to restrain sin in your life, you need to mind the thing. You need to reckon yourself to be that, that you are dead to sin alive, even though you're going to sin. It's not going to be imputed unto you. The whole issue now is sin. Is it not being a, a reigning in your life? It's all been forgiven, but now you want to live unto God. You don't want it to reign in your life. In order for it to not reign in your life, you need to reckon yourself to be dead to sin, alive unto God. The very thing that the Spirit did to you, in you. And so your part in that is minding that. He goes, he goes down, look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth what? Life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And, and he goes on. And then he comes along in verse 14. He says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Don't put this new identity that you have underneath that law. That's not how you got it in the first place. That's not how it's going to operate in you. Because you go back under the law, even though, you have a new, even though you've been baptized into Christ, sin will be revived, he's going to go along and say. So you don't put yourself under the law. Because what? The, the letter what? Killeth. So don't do that. But what is this life all about? What is, what is God all about and being his people all about? Come over to Romans chapter 8. Remember, in that law was Romans, or Galatians 3 was a schoolmaster. And Roman, or Galatians 4 it was a tutor and governor. It was that mediator educating system that the father put in play. He wasn't teaching Israel himself. That law was teaching them. It was a tutor and a governor. Well, if that was under the Old Testament, the New Testament would be him bringing them unto himself and him teaching him. And him having a, an intimacy of fellowship with him. And being their God and him being his people and then taking that to another level. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 1. He's going to encapsulate everything that he's dealt with in Romans 6 and 7 in chapter 8. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law, there it is, the law. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Two laws involved. One law you operate upon, one you no longer, it, it frees you from. You're, the, the walking after the Spirit is based upon the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And if the New Testament is not according to the Old Testament, then that law cannot be the law of Moses. That law is a new law. It's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. They didn't know that back then because Christ hadn't come, but they start to 
That's why you got that royal law of liberty and all the other things out there in, in Hebrews through Revelation. It's talked about different because it's tailor-made for Israel's program, but some of the concepts are the same. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, self-justification, self-sanctification, the law couldn't produce that. For what the law could not do is weak through the flesh. God, sending in his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. He's going to put it in, your, put it in you for you to walk after. Now he goes on. Well, let's just read down through. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You're minding that you're dead to sin and alive unto God. That law, that's what you're minding. It's, it, a law becomes an operating principle by which every time it's utilized, it works. That law, the law of Moses, every time they tried to keep it, it worked. It showed them that they're a sinner. Every single time. This law, every time we operate upon it, we will not face that condemnation. That old wretched man that he says there in chapter 7. But if we walk after the Spirit and operate upon that law, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, before when sin is at its doorstep, as it were, we will, we will operate upon a power to restrain that in our life. And if you do sin, you, don't, you, you give in to sin's lust, and you do sin afterwards, if you mind the things of the Spirit and walk after the law of the Spirit like Christ Jesus, that condemnation can be gone. Always works. We'll eventually deal with it in more detail. But we're supposed to mind that. It's supposed to be a, a, a ever working in our minds. He goes on uh, in chapter, uh, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There's that life issue again. But because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's that, the law of Moses, the law of God. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I'm just reading up until this next one. So we saw the issue of his law right in their hearts, and therefore he'll, he's our God and we will be his people. Now we're looking for this fellowship, intimacy of fellowship one. Verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Once you start minding the things of the Spirit... What's taking place within you is the Spirit's dwelling. You, you've been given the Spirit in Romans, Romans 5. The issue of the Spirit dwelling in us is not a second baptism or any of those things, but the Spirit, dwelling in, the Spirit dwells in us, is comfortable in us. You don't, you don't dwell when you go on voc vocation. You dwell in your house. It's comfortable. It's furnished to where you want it furnished. And, and the, as we are the workmanship of God, when He baptizes us into Christ, we're dead to sin, alive unto God. When that's in our that, when we're minding that, the Spirit is dwelling in us. He's He's comfortably residing within us, and that's the that's that next step for what He's going to do. He goes on verse uh, verse nine. But if you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. He does. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of His. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. That's what we want. But at the same time, this is basically what he's saying there, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Well, explain that to me. Verse 11, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also what? Quicken your mortal bodies by a Spirit that dwelleth in you. When you're minding the things of the Spirit, the Spirit's dwelling in you, and he'll quicken your mortal body. And you can, for the... Not for the first time, but you can, therefore, do things unto God's honor and glory that are pleasing to Him because it's after the Spirit. He'll quicken your mortal body. This, this mortal body, even though He hasn't eradicated sin out of our members, if you walk after the Spirit, He'll quicken your body to live unto Him. Well, how do I live unto Him? I know I have a newness of life, Romans 6. How do I live unto Him? Verse 12, He's going to go on. Therefore, Brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Flesh did us nothing, just death. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, that law. But now, now it's the issue of, now he's going to quicken my mortal body. What do I do with this quickened mortal body? What, 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 what am I to do with it? Well, you don't, that Old Testament, I was taught under that Old Testament by the tutor and governors of it. So now I have a quick and mortal body. Do I, am I, do I continue to be dealt with the, taught by the tutors and governors? No, nope. I have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That, that's that law. The law of Moses, I should, I should clarify that now. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Up until Romans 8, all we've seen in the book of Romans is the Lord Jesus Christ being the Son and God, well, he says God our Father, but you, you, you see that in between the, the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. Romans 8, he, now become, he, he always has been since you believe, but now you learn about it. You learn that he's your Father. And that spirit of bondage, that tutor and governor isn't going to teach you anymore. He's gotten that out of the way. Now he's going to teach you. Come last verse as we wrap this up, Romans 15. And as our father, he gets into Romans 9, 10, 11. I'm not going to teach you Israel's program. You're, you're not going to be under Israel's program. That's what, I mean, an oversimplistic way of stating Romans 9, 10, 11. In Romans 12, he begins to teach us as a father. As we present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. We present our body the way in which we, the Spirit quickens our body. And now he adds to that newness of life details of how to live this life that's in contrast to the world. And you get to chapter 15 and it's kind of like there's a statement here that sum, sums up all what he went through in Romans. And it's in connection with how he began it, with that spirit of holiness, the spiritual things of the New Testament. Look what he says here in Romans 15. And look at verse 26. Uh, 25. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, and it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of whose? Yes. Their spiritual things. See, it's Israel's spiritual things. We're not a part of Israel's program. We're not a continuation of Israel's program. But we do partake of their spiritual things in our program. He says their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. There's poor saints at Jerusalem because God changed the program. He told them to sell all. When he changed the program, now they're poor. So he, Paul's going out to now Gentiles, churches that he's established in dispensation of grace the body of Christ's churches to collect money to bring back to the poor saints at Jerusalem. And one of the reasons why he gives that, he says, hey, if you've been partakers of their spiritual things, then it's your duty to give them carnal things. Give them some money. Help them out. That's the least you can do. But I bring that verse up to come along and show you their spiritual things isn't the law of Moses. That's all physical. That's all carnal, that's all performance-based acceptance. Their spiritual things is God doing for them that which they can't do for themselves and he put that in that New Testament. And Paul comes along and says in Romans, before you even get the 1 Corinthians, so he doesn't just bring it up once, he brings it up many, many other times before that. Spirit of holiness and partaker of their spiritual things. That's what we've been partakers of. We have that same foundation. The issue is how you're going to build upon that. You're going to build upon that, not by Hebrews of Revelation, the Gospel accounts, Israel's program. You're going to build upon that, the mystery of Christ and what Paul sends forth in, in his epistles. Now, just to conclude, the reason, again, the reason why I go through all that, and we'll, we'll bridge the gap next lesson, is because when, when he brings up this New Testament, the night he's betrayed, and he institutes that table right there, it's a part of the New Testament not a part of the, the Old Testament. And if we are partakers of their spiritual things and able ministers in that New Testament, then that table is for us as well. Now there are, in, there are issues to rightly divide, and we'll deal with that, but that table is the same. That foundation is the same. 
And so we'll, we'll bridge that gap next time and look at the gospel accounts and then we'll start coming over to 1 Corinthians and start dealing with those details and the context of, all, of, of how he's dealing with it. But again, I'll say that one phrase again. Not everything Paul says is a mystery, but the time frame in which he says it, apart from Israel, that's a mystery. And it's going to eventually come in Paul's epistles where, yeah, everything that he's saying is just part of that mystery. But when you first start out, that foundation, as you read it there in Romans chapter 1, is according to the scriptures of the prophets. And that's why, you can, that's why he goes back to the seed of David. That's why he goes back to uh, uh, the resurrection from the dead and all those things, because he's talking about that, that spirit of holiness. And so, again, if you have any questions, we'll have time. You can come up and ask me right away. We'll have a question and answer time once we get done with this series and at the end of a congregational meeting. We'll have questions about this too. But this is that foundation that we need to have now as we go forth and continue to look at the, the other matters as we look at the Lord's table. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look into this, this issue, the Lord's table. And all we have right now, uh, as far as what I've gone through, is that we're able ministers of that New Testament, lining up right with what Paul says. Uh, partaker of spiritual things, that terminology comes from Romans 15, that spirit of holiness according to the seed of David and lining up the, that New Testament and that being provided through the Redeemer, the mechanical means of God's Jehovahness and grace given in that Davidic covenant and it all coming together. And the thing that we need is the dispensation of grace to be beneficiaries of it and, and we're in that and that started with Paul. And so may we understand these things uh, as, as these things are foundational, that we are able ministers of the New Testament, partakers of their spiritual things. And this table, the Lord's table, not our table, the Lord's table, not any other table in the world. There are many tables out there. But this is the Lord's table. And to see what it is, see the purpose in it that gives it the punch of, of, of what it shows. It shows the Lord's death, but also who it shows and the impact that it makes as we show it. So Father, I pray that we would be excited to study these things out, want them to, to understand them in further detail, and, uh, and we'll do that as we go on. We thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully, according to the effectual working of your word in us, that as the Spirit writes those things on our heart. And I do pray if anyone's here listening that has not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins, was buried and rose again, that they would do so this very moment and God will justify them, forgive their iniquity, all their iniquity, all their sins. They'll receive the forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future, and you'll remember it no more. And therefore, you'll justify them unto eternal life. They can have the gift of eternal life right now if they believe. We thank you for all these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.